PIVU for organizing for organizing um, this event, uh, and uh, definitely warm regards to all our, our friends in Haiti. And uh, I know you are incredibly um, dedicated, courageous, and uh, and really have really been an inspiration to a lot of us in terms of what you've endured and and really been very resilient in addressing. And uh, definitely, I'm uh, I'm very excited and honored to to be speaking to you today. Um, one of the topics that I do a lot of, believe it or not, clinical care in is penile cancer. And I'm involved in a bunch of various initiatives with relating to penile cancer research and education. I'm, uh, I'm actually the uh, chair of the American Urological Association core curriculum of education. And I'm also the, uh, the NCCN vice chairman of the guidelines on bladder and penile cancer. And I also serve at my cancer center as the assistant chief of surgery and a senior professor in genital urinary oncology. So I, I do a lot of surgery. I take care of a lot of patients with this disease. Uh, and I definitely, I have definitely would love to speak to you. And if there's certain topics that you want to get a little bit more in detail to discuss clinical questions and things, you know, I have slides here, but I'm happy to, to make this more, you know, applicable, clinically relevant and, uh, and get away from the slide deck a little bit to talk a little bit about more clinical questions or think, thoughts that you all wanna discuss. So my disclosures again is, is my leadership positions on the NCCN. And actually there's an initiative that I've been privileged to be involved with, which some of you may be interested in called the Global Society of Rare Genitalia Tumors. As you all know, there hasn't been very good things to happen throughout a pandemic, but one of the only good things to me has been, we've developed a society dedicated to rare cancers like penile, urethral, and testicular cancer. And we do a lot of research and education and patient advocacy. So we have a website, uh, it's all free. Uh, it's a non-financially driven initiative. And there's a lot of great resources for patients, for clinicians on this. And I welcome you to take a look at, at some of the materials we have related to this. So I'm speaking to people who, who see probably a fair amount of, of, of this condition, penile cancer in their practices, but just going back to numbers. So it, looking at 2018, about 12, uh, close to 2000 cases of penile cancer in, in North America, in 2021, it's estimated to be slightly above 2100 cases. So not a huge number of cases, what we do see in the United States and in Canada as well. Typically, you see more specific cases in certain institutions, so we have developed some level of expertise. And so along with that, I think there have been some improvements in clinical care when they, patients get care at, at higher volume centers. We don't see, unfortunately, luckily for us, that many patients die of penile cancer, but unfortunately, we do know that things like advanced clinical stage and nodal stage really strongly predicts how patients do. That represents about 400 deaths every single year. As you all know that practice medicine and surgery, when a patient develops advanced penile cancer though, it's very, very difficult to control, very symptomatic. And unfortunately, sometimes it's quite challenging to make the patients comfortable and to treat them. Also, I also like to always mention um, from, a, from an educational standpoint, the AJCC staging system for penile cancer changed in 2018 when T2 and T3 distinguish whether corpus spongiosal versus cavernosal invasion happens. In the prior uh, seventh edition of the AJCC, urethral invasion was a distinguishing feature between T2 and T3, but that does, no longer applies. And I'll show you a little bit of data why that is. Also in terms of lymph nodes, you can have up to two unilateral lymph nodes in N1, greater than two nodes or bilateral lymph nodes, as long as there's no external extension represents N2. And N3 is if the pelvic lymph nodes or if you have external extension. This is a comparison of the uh, AJCC, the seventh edition and the eighth edition. And it just, again, summarizes some of the factors were mentioned here versus T2, T3. And again, no relevance related to urethral invasion anymore in the current staging system. This is what it looks like at the histology level. So a T1 tumor, you see here some, some tumor associated and confined to the subepithelial connective tissue. Once the spongiosum, and you see this is the smooth muscle spongiosum is involved, that becomes a T2 tumor. And these are the, the cavernosal smooth, boss, uh, smooth muscle and bodies associated with cancer, as you see here. And once that happened, that becomes a T3 tumor. 
I also like to mention it's important to look for certain uh, characteristics like lymphovascular invasion. Something that's new in the new staging system is perineural invasion, whether or not you see nerve cancer along the nerve roots of the cancer itself. This is an article we wrote a few years ago, really validating the new staging system as something which has clinical value. But I always like to mention, it's not perfect. So what you're seeing here is that as you advance with clinical stage from a T1A to a T4 tumor, you see that the risk stratification survival changes, but there is crossover between T3, for example, and T2 here, telling you that it's not a perfect model. And probably there's gonna be further refinements of this. People always ask me, they say, what, what's gonna likely change? And it's good to sort of look at what's coming in science. And what really is coming down the pipeline is that we clearly know peanut cancer, which we'll talk a little bit about, is either HPV specific or driven or not. And HPV tumors typically do better. And it's probably that we're gonna start classifying tumors by HPV status. And along with that, I think that's gonna probably stratify the cancer a little bit better. This is also a curve that shows you the differences in survival along those clinical stages. And I always like to mention this important factor is even, this is data from the cancer registry in the United States called the SEER database. And you see that, as you all know, when you get to a stage of T2 or greater, that's usually an indication that you should remove the lymph nodes, irrespective of whether lymph nodes are palpable or not. But you see, even across the United States, very few institutions are actually doing that. Only about 30, close to 38% of the time are they performing an angle lymph node dissection. And if you look at academic centers, we always think we do well in academic centers. It's probably better, but we only do it in about three quarters of the time our patients ring actually undergoing lymph node dissection. And you all know this is that probably why that is not happening is a lot of patients are reluctant to have surgery because of this morbidity of the operation. Some surgeons may not even feel comfortable doing the operation in certain places. And I think that probably also has importance why that's not being done as much as it should. I also like to mention that nodal staging is, is a critical factor. And actually, if you look at what of the staging predictors are the strongest of how patients are gonna do is the, the, the nodal burden of disease. And when you start getting into N3 disease with external extension or pelvic adenopathy, we clearly see it here, patients are at very high risk of progression. Histology makes a difference as well. So staging, as you know, but histological subtypes, things like verrucous carcinoma, as you all know, tends to be very favorable. It tends to be associated with HPV. It could be very locally advanced, meaning spreading into large areas of the skin, but very rarely will it metastasize. For us, says things like basaloid or, or sarcomatoid carcinomas, they tend to be much more aggressive, tend to spread much more, and much less likely to respond to chemotherapy. I always tell people this is a very sombering slide. And what this represents here is that when you start looking at the survival curves for penile cancer over the last 20 to 25 years, looking at SEER data and European data, this UNIS database, basically you're seeing the survival curves basically have not changed over 20 to 25 years. And as you know, in the cancer world, that's really staggering, basically telling us that we're not really improving how patients are going to do. And why that likely is, is because probably most of these tumors do not typically respond that well to chemotherapy. So they are chemo resistant. This is some, some data which sort of highlights this fact. This is a paper from the group from Fox Chase Cancer Center. They looked at the, another database called the NCDB database of peanut cancer. And they looked at patients who had nymph node positive disease. And they looked at data over a 10 year period. And they found that the use of chemotherapy improved from about 38 to 48%. But what were the factors that predicted survival? The only factor predicted survival was undergoing an inguinal lymph node dissection. Chemotherapy or radiotherapy did not improve survival. This is seen very well here. So this is the survival curves of patients who had lymph node dissection versus the ones that didn't. And this is again, looking at the various groups in terms of which ones got chemo or did not get chemo. But this to me is the most compelling slide right here is that the, all these curves at the top here are patients who had chemotherapy, uh, I mean, underwent inguinal lymph node dissection. So, and this is all the curves of patients that did not undergo lymph node dissection. So basically what, you're, what that's telling you is that lymph node dissection is the single driver of, of distinguishing survival, regardless of whether or not they got chemotherapy or whether or not they got radiotherapy. 
We also looked at this, this is a paper we published a few years ago in European Urology. We looked at data from two centers and we found that in most patients with lymph node disease that are bulky, they got chemotherapy about 67% of the time. In other patients who underwent surgery alone, uh, we see that only about 30% uh, about of patients were still alive. And the factors that predicted survival were no perioperative treatments. So meaning if you got chemo radiotherapy, it did not improve survival in terms of cancer specific overall survival. And this goes back to the point I made earlier is that what predicts best how patients are gonna do, it's the nodal burden. So N1 in blue, N2 and N3. So that predicts progression free, cancer specific and overall survival very significantly. People always say, well, you know, we've developed guidelines in penile cancer in the NCCN and within the EAU. But how often is that being sort of adhered to? And this one curve, again, shows the fact that most patients, even if they have a high-grade tumor, are not undergoing lymph node dissection, and very few patients are undergoing chemotherapy in this setting. This is the adoption of inguinal lymph node dissection over time. So you see, although in recent years, we see that patients are going more frequently into lymph node dissection if they have clinical factors associated with it, it still remains somewhat underutilized. I always get a question, what are some of the factors that predict whether patients are going to have adherence to guidelines? And it's the things that you unfortunately would expect. Socioeconomic status, people that get richer have better insurance, have better access to care. Uh, patients, unfortunately, have certain racial ethnicities in the United States, like African-Americans and Hispanics, have less access to care, and that is, is associated with less adherence to guidelines in terms of where they're treated. And getting cared for at an academic versus other community-based centers that's probably because of the fact most community centers don't have experience treating this. So often they will not do evidence-based treatment in terms of caring for patients. So I mentioned HPV. So about 40 to 60% of penile cancers are associated with HPV. We're not gonna get into too much you know, uh, carcinogenesis and clinical and biological pathways, but the fact the way that's generated is through the E6 and E7 pathways and they're affecting the retinoblastoma gene causing downstream phosphorylation, proliferation, aneuploidy, and ultimately resulting in cell immortalization and cancer progression. This is a, a slide we generated from a, a recent review we, we worked on. It really shows potential areas where you can target certain drugs in penile cancer. I will tell you most of the time at this point in the United States and most parts of the world, patients are, are if they're gonna get certain types of therapies, it's, it's usually platinum-based chemotherapy, Typically, uh, TIP is the chemotherapy most frequently used. There are some, I would say, very low-level evidence that certain forms of immunotherapies may be beneficial in certain patients with penile cancer, particular patients who are pdl one positive or if they have certain high tumor mutational burdens. But still, for the fact, is really is areas of, that are poorly studied. These are some of these basket trials in penile cancer. And what that basically means is that Sometimes because penile cancer is so rare, we lump it with head and neck squamous cell carcinomas and head and neck, uh, rectal carcinomas, squamous cell carcinomas that are HPV specific. And we decide to treat a bunch of patients with penile cancer along with those groups to try to increase accrual to certain trials. And obviously that's why some of the pharmaceutical companies will, will sponsor them is, is if we can accrue patients. Now, the benefit of that is there are some interesting compounds and combinations of immunotherapies that are being looked at. But I will tell you, and we published some work on this, is that HPV cancer of the head and neck, HPV cancer of the squamous of the rectum, HPV cancer of the penis are not exactly the same when you look at the genomic abnormalities associated with them. So I always tell people you have to be a little cautious because a chemotherapy or immunotherapy work for a head and neck cancer doesn't mean it's going to work for penile cancer, for example. This is also an area of, of interest of ours at our institution and in my research is how about HPV vaccination? Is there a role in preventing peanut cancer? Well, if you look at the data very critically, the only association we have between HPV vaccination is that it decreases the incidence of what are called extra gen external genital lesions, uh, which can be precursors to peanut cancer. It's never been shown to decrease the actual incidence of peanut cancer itself. Now, an interesting area, and this is on a review that we wrote, well, how about if you have a patient who have as a preneoplastic lesion, giving an HPV vaccine to boost your immune system, 
a little bit like we do with vaccinations for other things to get antibodies so that when you do get cancer, at least you have antibodies against the cancer. Interesting. Uh, I don't think there's any good data that, that this is beneficial. I'll tell people the risks are minimal. A vaccine for this is really the only side effect you're going to get is potentially some, some pain at the injection site or maybe mild fevers. No serious side effects associated with it. So I definitely think in certain populations where the incidence of, of penile and other types of cancers, head, neck, rectal cancer are high, I definitely think HPV vaccination should be encouraged in young people, typically between the ages of anywhere from about 16 to about 25. So these are the NCCN guidelines for 2021. And we'll talk a little bit about more in depth now. So we're gonna talk a little bit about managing the primary cancer, managing the inguinal lymph nodes and managing advanced disease. So first thing I always like to emphasize is when I was training, I was taught when you, you have to do a partial pen, total penectomy on everyone with penile cancer and you gotta get a two centimeter margin, that's the standard. But that's changed a little bit. Uh, I will tell you most of the time, if you see a superficial tumor, if it's in a favorable location, you sometimes wanna try to optimize how much of uh, the penis you can spare, obviously to maintain quality of life without compromising cancer outcomes. I will tell you, if you look at the data from North America, this is from a publication we had a few years ago, we are doing more penile sparing treatments today than we used to many years ago. And also this is, I think, a very important factor. This is a, a study that was done by a colleague and a friend of mine in, in the United Kingdom, Nick Watkin. And what Nick did is he basically looked at over 300 patients that they treated at their institution. And they looked at the size of the margins they got in their patients. And basically what Nick was able to show is as long as you had a, a margin that was at least one millimeter from the cancer, the risk of recurrence was very low, 1% or less. When the margin was less than one millimeter, that's when the risk of recurrence was much higher. So bottom line is, if you get a negative margin, that probably should be good enough, as long as your pathologist is, is convinced and you feel as a surgeon convinced that you got negative margins. We published this paper a few years ago, uh, and it's, I think, an important paper. There's the largest series of penile sparing uh, treatment of, that's ever been reported in journal urology. So over 1,200 cases, and you see here, the risk of recurrences is, is about 20 to 25%. Most of these recurrences will happen in the first year or so, about 39%. When the majority are, of the patients that have recurrences are actually candidates the penile sparing treatments again. So that basically means that if you do penile sparing treatment and you follow the patient carefully, usually you can salvage them with, again, another penile sparing surgical treatment. In terms of the factors that predict recurrence, treatment type, and if the tumor is a 2-2 tumor or greater. And when that was associated with that, you see here that the risk was much higher of recurrences. So this is the series I talked to you about, the current series, 1,200 patients. As you see, the largest series by far of penile sparing treatment, risk of recurrence about 21%. The factors of predicted recurrence, again, clinical stage, and the type of treatment. And you're going to say, well, what type of treatments are associated with a higher risk of recurrence? And what we see is for example, laser therapy, particularly for tumors that are a little bulkier, doesn't work quite as well as doing a wide local excision or doing a partial penectomy, or if it's a very distal foreskin lesion, a penile circumcision, for example. People always ask me, well, how do you treat carcinoma in situ? So you know the new way of saying carcinoma in situ for penile cancer is they call it PEIN or penile intraepithelial neoplasia grade three or four is, is usually the term that's now used. So we reported again a paper a couple of years ago in the British Journal, looking at 200 patients with penile carcinoma in situ over five centers, 48 patients had recurrences within 40 months, and the majority of recurrences were in fact found in the laser group. So again, going back to that point I told you is laser is something we've moved away at our institution and some of the other institutions as well, just because the risk of recurrence is so high. What I typically do when I see carcinoma in situ is I actually choose topical chemotherapy. So the agent I typically use is 5-FU, or we call it FUDEX. We typically will apply it once a day for eight hours. We'll do it for six weeks, and then we'll see the patient back six weeks later. So six weeks of treatment, six weeks of just monitoring, and then we reassess the patient. We use 5-FU first line, and we use imiquimod second line in these patients. What we found, and this is the paper again from uh, the group from the United Kingdom, they treated 86 patients with carcinoma in situ, 44 patients were treated with topical chemotherapy and it consists of the study population. 
and overall the response rate was really good was a complete response in 57 percent partial response in 13 percent so overall 70 percent of patients responded and the remaining patients had recurrences but most of these were salvaged with other topical chemotherapies or with a local excision so usually what i'll do is i'll try 5fu if i see good response and no suspicious areas then i'll just monitor them if i see a suspicious area i'll do a biopsy and if it recurs I'll either consider a mepomod as a second line or I'll consider doing a local excision. The toxicity of these agents is really quite low, only about 10%. I spent quite a lot of time, I was in clinic today, so I spent some time explaining to patients how to put the, the imiquimod and the 5-FU carefully because sometimes people lather it very severely, it can cause bad toxicity. This is the paper we've published, looking at toxicity of these two agents. And you see most of the toxicity with these agents is really low. It's grade one or grade two. And most of the time it's pain at the injection site or irritation. Most of the time it goes away within three to four weeks. People always ask, well, how do you manage the non-palpable inguinal lymph nodes in patients who, for example, have a high-risk primary tumor? So this was a paper that was published a few years ago. And I think it's a very important paper because what the group from the Netherlands did they looked at patients who had bulky or aggressive primary tumors, but had no palpable lymph nodes. And they said, let's look at how patients do that have no palpable lymph nodes and we monitor them, or we basically go ahead and operate on them. So they waited in the patients that they monitored and did anything, they waited to develop palpable lymph nodes. And what they basically showed is early surgery made a difference. So if you had early surgery, this is your survival curve in terms of disease specific survival versus delayed. So the bottom line is if you have an indication to have surgery, you should do it soon. We published this paper a couple of years afterwards. We basically looked at this a little bit more critically to say, well, you're, I'm saying that early surgery makes a difference. Well, what's the timeline there? How long should you wait or can you wait before it makes a difference? And it's three months. If you basically wait more than three months when someone has an indication to undergo surgery, ultimately the, the risk of progression is much higher of recurrence as well. And these were the survival curves we saw of early versus late surgery. So the traditional approach, as you know, in patients who have palpable lymph nodes is give six weeks antibiotics. If the lymph nodes go away, then you should get a biopsy. You should consider doing surgery. Well, that was a classic teaching. We don't do that anymore. Most of the time, the indication is you should get a biopsy directly. And if there was cancer in the lymph nodes, do surgery at that point. Why should we not give antibiotics? It delays treatment. And sometimes that could result in the patients having a higher risk of recurring. Now, a biopsy can be done in interventional radiology, or as a clinician, you can do a, a needle aspiration or a core biopsy under ultrasound, or if visibly you see the lesion, you could do it that way. And it gives you a way to really know a much quicker, ultimately, what you're dealing with. These are, again, from the NCCN guidelines, is if you have a, a really small lymph node, and uh, again, you're suspicious, you either could do a biopsy or go straight to surgery. If you do a biopsy and it's positive, you go straight to surgery. If they have bulky disease, or if you're concerned, you can give chemotherapy before you do surgery. And then ultimately what you do afterwards depends on what the pathology shows. How do you do the operation? Well, everyone has different approaches. My typical approach is I still do a fair amount of these open surgeries. I will do an incision about one finger breadth below the inguinal ligament, about typically 11 to 12 centimeter incision, really making it, uh, you know, uh, the low scarpus fascia, make sure you clean out the uh, triangle, make sure it, whenever possible, I spare the sap in its vein and really wait. You know, I do the superficial lymph nodes first. If they're negative, we stop. If, I have, if I'm comfortable with my pathologist, there's no lymph nodes involved. If the superficial ones are involved, then I'll go on to do the deep lymph nodes as well. We looked at the complications associated with inguinal lymph node dissection a few years ago. And uh, I will say that for the most part, complications have gone down. And if you look at this again, is from a few years ago, but overall complication rate is about 50%. Most of these are local complications. And most of the time, these are highly manageable and salvageable. Uh, these are some of the complications and some of the things you could do technically to reduce their incidence. Obviously, technique, surgery-wise, make sure you don't get skin flaps that are too thin. Prophylactic antibiotics, leaving a drain in place, uh, being very diligent in uh, controlling lymphatics, those all make a big difference. We also published this paper a few years ago, 
looking at complications, but across the world at some of the higher volume centers, we looked at 320 patients. And then we looked at the incidence of complications. And again, about a third of patients had complications. Uh, most of these uh, were, were uh, minor complications. About two thirds were minor and about a third of these were major complications. And these are what the major complications were. So you see the fact, the fact or predictors of getting a complications are also the ones that predict doing a good operation. If you remove lymph, more lymph nodes, if, if the lymph node density goes down, then the bottom line is it probably means you've, you've removed more lymph nodes and you did a more extensive surgery and consequences, probably a higher risk of having lymph node leakage, a lymph seal, a lymphocele or skin necrosis associated with it. So I think everything has to be done with a grain of salt. Obviously you have to do a good operation but whenever possible, control the lymphatics and make sure again, the skin flaps are not too thin. This is the laparoscopic approach or minimally invasive. Uh, the, the people in, uh, in South America talked about what's called the veil or the uh, video endoscopic inguinal lymph node dissection, which is the same thing as a, lap, a pure laparoscopic approach. And then the group from Emory University in Atlanta described the robotic experience with this. And uh, they treated uh, 29 patients were treated, only nine patients in the context of penile cancer, the rest were in the setting of melanoma. And of the 40 groin groans approach, minor complications were seen in about 27% and major complications in about 15%. The steps of this approach is, if you're gonna do it robotically is, you wanna do triangulation. So typically you'll do the first port fairly close to the knee. You're gonna develop usually using a balloon insufflator, the space. And then you wanna make sure that your lateral ports are very lateral so you don't avoid clashing. Now also what you were seeing it technically in the United States is now people are doing single site or robotic single port surgery. It does make a difference. When you do the surgery, it's important that you identify the inguinal ligament, which is usually your first boundary dissection. And then you skeletonize lymph nodes using the adductor longus and sartorius boundary. So you do the same essential approach. Some of the robotic surgeons I talked to, they remove the superficial and deep altogether. They prefer doing it that way. I always say, if you could only do a superficial, do a superficial and then wait for the frozen sections. But the reason I say that is because once you do the deep lymph nodes, that's when patients get really bad lymphedema in their lower extremities. So if you can avoid it, definitely try to do so. I also uh, I have a lot of colleagues that take the staphnus vein and all the laparoscopic or robotic cases. And again, there's a, de a definite benefit if you can spare the saphenous vein in terms of minimizing uh, significant lymphedema in the lower extremities. This is the group from India. They published this paper about a year ago using their robotic approach. And what they did is they compare uh, the robotic to the open approach, and they did a nice job. This is in journal Urology. 51 patients underwent the robotic, 100 patients underwent the open approach. And you see that the groups are very well controlled in terms of the characteristics of the patients, in terms of stage, in terms of grade, in terms of nodal burden. And you found one of the strongest predictor of complications was the type of surgery. So patients who had the robotic surgery had a much lower incidence of having complications associated with it. As I was mentioning, the single port surgery is also something that colleagues in South America and others have described and have done. It actually makes sense for certain patients to do that. Uh, but I always caution, like anything else in surgery, as you all know, the devil is in the details. And I, what I mean by that is, if I see a patient in my practice who has very large lymph nodes and I need to do a very extensive operation or if they got chemotherapy or if it's a recurrence, then I really want to remove all the lymph nodes in the, in the area, skeletonize the blood vessels, oftentimes get behind the blood vessels and really make sure I do a good clean out because oftentimes that may be your only chance at curing that patient. And as you all know, you can't make up for a bad operation. Once it's done, it's done. And sometimes the patients may not be salvaged in terms of if they do get a recurrence. Another technique which also has got a lot of popularity is the sentinel lymph node biopsy. You see a lot of this being done in Europe uh, today. It was described over 30 years ago by a colleague, Cabanas, who worked in the melanoma field. And then uh, actually a colleague and a friend of mine in, in the Netherlands, Simon Hornblast, pioneered it for penile cancer. And what he did is he used a combination of technetium with a blue dye and what they do is they inject those combinations at the at partial penectomy site or at the scar, and it gets taken up by the lymphatics to what is called your, your sentinel node. And typically, 
uh, that node is the first lymph node which should be affected by cancer. Uh, in the initial reports, they found the false negative rate was up to 18%. We wrote a paper a couple of years uh, in, in my fellowship, so when I was there in, uh, in Texas, and what we did is we showed in patients who had the injection of this agent, we did the sentinel lymph node biopsy, and then what we then did is removed and did an inguinal lymph node dissection. So we compared sentinel lymph node biopsy to the gold standard in the same patient. So we, made the, we did both operations on the patient to see how well they compared to one another. And what you find is we did 31 patients underwent surgery and you found the sensitivity of sentinel lymph node biopsy was only 71%. There was two false negative cases. Why did that happen? Probably it was experience. It's also probably has to do with some of the other characteristics. So sometimes the cancer occludes the lymph nodes and so the cancer may not necessarily go to the sentinel lymph node specifically. The group from the United Kingdom start talking about describing and optimizing that approach using ultrasound. So they do an ultrasound in all clinically node negative patients, and they do a needle aspiration of any suspicious lymph node. And by doing that, they decrease the false negative rate closer to like five to 8%. This is a new technique that the, the group from the Netherlands, uh, Oscar Brouwer is the person that does a lot of research in peanut cancer over there. They looked at over 350 patients, 740 anal lymph nodes, they, and now they changed the technique a little bit. They don't use just technetium. They use technetium with IGC, which gives you a nice uh, uh, green color in the operating room. And what they find is using this combination technique, the performance is outstanding. They did not miss a single cancer in any of these lymph nodes. And, and so they describe this as really a future in terms of what can be done. And you can see the lymph nodes, you can see them very well on imaging, but you see them very well using uh, special cameras in the operating room. Now, <clears throat> I actually wrote an editorial to this paper in European Urology. And the reason why is this, is that to get the experience to do this, you have to see a lot of peanut cancer at the individual center. It's very expensive and you need a lot of special techniques, special people to do this. And so how applicable and how you know, broadly this is gonna be adopted across the world, I, I really question, but that being said, I do think it's a, it's a good technique, novel technique and one at centers where they see a lot of this should be developed. So let's talk a little bit about managing more advanced cancer. So this is a, I would say the first major study looking at this, Lance Bagliario at, at the MD Anderson Institution did a, a phase two prospective trial in patients with bulky lymph nodes with clinically N2 and N3 disease. So bulky cancer in those lymph nodes without cancer anywhere else. <clears throat> patients got chemotherapy using that regimen I mentioned earlier of TIP, and then they underwent surgery. They treated a total of 30 patients. Response rates were seen in 15 patients, representing 50% response rate. Three patients had no cancer in the specimen. So basically that tells you chemo only killed only three out of the 30 patients. So a 10% complete response rate is what they saw. Nine patients were, had no evidence of disease at a fall for 34 months. And 11 of 22 patients underwent surgery experienced tumor progression. So that's 50%. These are the survival curves. You see again, overall patients with this regimen uh, still had a high risk of progressing. If you responded to chemotherapy, you did better. If you had a, a skin involvement, uh, you did worse. And overall, it tells you a little bit about the natural history. And what we did a few years ago is we took that Pagliero paper and we took all the big studies which have looked at giving chemotherapy in patients with advanced penile cancer and wanted to say, okay, what is the best level evidence that chemotherapy makes a difference for penile cancer? So the objective response rate or the ORR, like we call it, was 53%. And the complete response rate, when you take all the literature out there, is 16%. Toxicity was about 40%. So most of the time, the chemotherapy is fairly toxic. But going back to what we had discussed earlier, chemotherapy probably doesn't work as well as we think, unfortunately. We wrote this paper also looking and trying to better define when you should give chemotherapy, neogen chemotherapy, and the factors that predict how patients do is, again, if you had bulky cancer, or if you had a positive PET scan, or if your ECOG status, or if your performance status was poor, you did worse. If you respond to chemotherapy, you did better in terms of survival, as you would expect. And also, this is a neat little calculator that people can use, is that it also allows you to use some of the characteristics of the cancer, meaning how many lymph nodes did you remove, how much cancer was in the lymph nodes, 
it, what was the a pathological nodal stage? Did you have positive surgical margin that predicts the risk of recurrence? So help you predict sometimes when you want to give adjuvant chemotherapy in these patients as well. So I always get a question, should we use PET-CT in penile cancer? And you know, in the United States, as you all know, people order tests without necessarily always thinking if it's a valuable test. So I get a lot of patients in my practice, they have a PET-CT and it has no clinical utility. So when should you not get a PET-CT? If you don't have any palpable lymph nodes, the sensitivity of PET is only 56%. So if you don't have palpable nodes, don't get a PET. If you have palpable nodes, it's probably very good in predicting positive lymph nodes in patients. So that's the right clinical scenario when you should use it. This is all a paper from the group from the Netherlands. They basically, two things they really showed in this paper is that if you responded to chemotherapy and you see that on the PET scan, it's a good thing. It means basically patients likely are gonna have a likelier chance of surviving. And also the, uh, there's good correlation between what you're seeing on the PET scan is what you see on the pathology. So valuable test. And you can see sometimes what I like to use PET-CT is it allows me to see small volume of cancer. I may not have picked up on the imaging study. So small volume of microscopic cancer can come up. And sometimes when you're planning an inguinal lymph node dissection, it may tell you sites of disease you really want to make sure you resect. So what I'll do in my practice is <clears throat> if someone's going to get chemotherapy, yeah, generally I'll get a PET-CT before. So I'll know how much, where the cancer was, what was the extent of the cancer was, so that when I do surgery, I'll make sure that I clean out all those lymph nodes when I do the operation. Is there a benefit to giving radiation? So this is a group of papers we've looked at looking at this. Uh, we looked at 92 patients who had positive pelvic lymph nodes for penile cancer. And overall, we found that patients who did not get radiation did worse. Patients that got radiation actually did better in terms of overall and disease-specific survival. As you all know, there's also an important factor here. Patients that got radiation probably were patients who were healthier, had a better performance status, highly motivated. So probably there is some element of selection bias. So the patients that got radiation probably were probably healthier patients as well. And these are the survival curves of patient again that got radiation versus those that did not. So when do I give radiation in penile cancer? Local control, or if I feel that I wanna, the patient may not have a resectable disease and I feel radiation may help increase that risk or likelihood. If I have locally advanced disease post-resection and I have external extension, or if I have positive pelvic lymph nodes, or I have positive surgical margins, and sometimes in the setting of local regional recurrence, although I would tell you, it's probably not the best salvage treatment regimen for patients. So we're now gonna talk a little bit about managing pelvic lymph nodes. So I was always taught if the pelvic lymph nodes were involved with penile cancer, you really shouldn't be offering these patients much in terms of only chemotherapy. And I'll tell you, for the most part, if the pelvic lymph nodes are involved, it's never a good thing, no question. But the survival curves are probably better than once we thought. And it all depends obviously on the amount of, of cancer in those lymph nodes. So I'll talk to you a little bit about some data we developed and the guidelines, the NCC and the EU guidelines reflect a lot of this. And again, uh, we'll talk a little bit about best level evidence. So when you remove the pelvic lymph nodes, what we talk about is removing the obturator lymph nodes, removing the external iliac lymph nodes and removing the common iliac lymph nodes. When you remove all of those, that's considered a, a appropriate extended pelvic lymph node dissection. In many ways, it's the same extent of lymph node dissection we do for, for bladder cancer as well. You could do it laparoscopic, you could do it open, you could do it robotic. Bottom line, it doesn't matter as long as you do the operation the right way. There's two studies which have looked specifically as when should you do a pelvic lymph node dissection. This is the Italian study. They looked at patients at their institution that had positive pelvic lymph nodes, total of, of close to 200 patients. They looked at the incidence of positive pelvic lymph nodes about 31%. On multivariate analysis, the predictors of positive pelvic lymph nodes were three or more inguinal lymph nodes involved, lymph nodes greater than three centimeters, or if there was external extension. And the proportion of positive pelvic lymph nodes increased depending on how many of these risk factors you had. If you only had zero risk factors, the incidence was 0%. If you had all three risk factors, the incidence was 57%. The group from the Netherlands also looked at that very same question. The incidence of pelvic lymph nodes was 24% in their group. And inguinal external extension and the presence of two or more inguinal lymph nodes predicted having positive pelvic lymph nodes. So on the whole, External extension or two or more nodes is probably an indication where you should do a pelvic lymph node dissection.
we published this paper as well, looking at when should you do a unilateral versus a bilateral lymph node dissection. So we looked at 140 patients with pelvic lymph nodes, 16 having bilateral lymph node disease, and the factors that predicted having bilateral pelvic lymph node metastases was four or more positive inguinal lymph nodes. If you had that, the uh, overall sensitivity was about 76%. So if we have four or more lymph nodes, that's usually when we're going to do a bilateral lymph node dissection. The presence of external extension on the pelvic lymph nodes is also something that's important, and it predicts uh, the likelihood that you're going to respond to chemotherapy. So, so usually when we talk about external extension, we're talking about external extension in the anal lymph nodes. Now we're talking specifically of external extension in the lymph nodes that are moving the pelvis. Obviously, that's never a good thing if you're seeing that. But we did see in the group that got chemotherapy, they did better. Again, there is some selection bias, meaning that the patients that got chemotherapy, probably the healthier, the fitter patients who had a better performance status. So I think some of these studies do give a little bit of clarification when you should do a lymph node dissection, the extended lymph node dissection, and whether you do a unilateral or bilateral dissection. So people always say, how do you survey penile cancer? So there's two studies which have looked at this. Uh, this is the classic study that was uh, published a few years ago from two centers in the Netherlands. And they found that the, about 29% of patients had recurrences. Most of the recurrences that were proximal within the primary happened within the first five to seven years. Distant recurrences themselves, typically they happen much earlier. They typically will happen in the first 12 to 18 months. And if you had distant recurrence, most patients die within two years. So again, local recurrences happen any time in that timeline, the distant recurrence is typically early, and unfortunately, most of the time, those are fatal events. We published this paper, it's just published in Journal Urology last month, if you guys all want to take a look at it. But it really shows several important factors, meaning, again, if it's a local recurrence, most of the time, you can salvage those patients. If it's a distant recurrence or a public recurrence, unfortunately, most of these patients will die within two to three years. And also, and this is uh, something which I think is very important, where do patients have recurrences? Well, a lot of the recurrences will depend on your nodal stage. If you have bulkier nodal disease, typically the chance of having a recurrence in the chest is much higher in the first two years. So based on that, patients will probably have a CT of the chest every three months for the first two years. If you're N1, N0, N1, the chance of recurrences in the chest are much lower and chest x-ray should be quite enough to do. In terms of when you follow patients, you probably need to follow patients for at least the first four to five years because, again, most of these recurrences can happen in that first four to five year timeline. So it's, again, important to follow patients a little longer than we typically do. This is what's called a violin plot, looking at when these recurrences happen. And again, it's important, again, to take that into account based on nodal burden of disease. Now, we're just going to finish off talking a little bit about management of local regional recurrences. And really what this really shows here is we looked at if someone has, for example, a previous inguinal lymph node dissection and they now have a recurrence in the inguinal area, what do you do about it? Classic teaching is hospice or palliation or you potentially would give radiation. We looked at in our group, we're looking at four centers over again, 20 years. So again, very selected patients doing surgery. So you have a recurrence, you give chemotherapy and then you do redo surgery. We treated 20 patients in that way, median time to recurrence again, typically in the first year. And overall, nine patients had no evidence of disease at last fall, nine of 20 patients. These were the survival curves in terms of patients uh, that had these types of recurrences. And the other option, as I mentioned, is salvage radiation. The group from the Netherlands reported on this in 26 patients. I would tell you, if you compare, again, surgery versus radiation, these are the real world experiences. Only two of 26 patients that got salvaged radiation were successfully salvaged. Therefore, if you're trying to potentially control and potentially cure someone with a recurrence, really radiation is not very effective in doing that. How about doing surgery in more patients with more proximal disease? So let's just now go down the scenario. If someone has penile cancer, you did surgery, now, a couple of years out, they now have a recurrence in the retroperitoneum. Should you do surgery? So the first thing to say is, the answer is no, you should not do surgery initially. But let's just say you give them chemotherapy, they do really well, you follow them for two, three years, and that's still the only site of disease. Should you do surgery? 
when we publish on three patients, so again, just looking at sent data from a tertiary care referral center over many years, you see that only three patients met that criteria. Uh, and you see that all three of those patients were cured. So there may be a very, very select role to doing a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection in that clinical setting for penile cancer as well. And this is the patient I operated on. Again, single lymph nodes right here. We resected it and they actually has done quite well. <clears throat> so when you do these salvage operations, oftentimes you have to remove the skin, the muscle, and therefore you live a really, really major defect. And this is one of my patients I treated several years ago. And once you resect that entire area, you clearly need to bring in a myocutaneous flap to cover the area. And typically what we'll do is we'll take the rectus muscle and we'll bring it down to cover the area. It's a big flap. Uh, usually I work with plastic surgeons in doing this. I'll tell you most of the time when we do this, it's usually associated with a high complication rate. We published this paper a couple of years ago. And initially when I presented at a meeting, people said, oh my God, I never realized this was such a morbid operation. We report a complication rate of 83%. So basically what the take home is, if you do the surgery, you're going to get a complication. Most of the time, it's not a severe complication, but it's just, this is very challenging surgery. And again, many patients will have some problems or some complication afterwards. And it's important obviously to tell the patients that. That being said, I do think it's a very good flap and it just needs to be very meticulously done and monitored afterwards. And again, that's, that's really the take home message from that study is if you're gonna do the surgery, you have to educate your patients. So this is a study which some of you may have seen is getting a lot of momentum internationally. It's called the IMPACT trial. So it's a prospective trial across the world trying to determine and getting the best level data of the benefit of giving neagic chemotherapy and penile cancer and also adjunct chemotherapy or, or chemoradiotherapy or also doing pelvic lymph node dissection. I serve as the surgical oversight chair for the study across the United States and Canada. And the study's designed this way. So patients come in with penile cancer, if they have bulky disease, they're randomized to getting neagic chemotherapy or neagic chemoradiotherapy or upfront surgery. If they have high-risk features on the pathology, meaning pathological N2, N3 disease, they are candidates to receive a second randomization for the study. The second randomization is either they get chemo radiotherapy as adjuvant or they get a prophylactic pelvic lymph node dissection. And I will tell you just in terms of where the study is, as its plan is to accrue 200 patients around the world. The study has been going on for two years. We've now put about 53 or 55 patients. We expect to publish and finish the study in the next two to three years. And I will tell you, that's probably gonna be the best level evidence of the, the best optimal treatment for patients with advanced penile cancer. Last but certainly a lot least, this is the society that again, I will disclose I'm the president of the Global Society of Rare GU Tumors, but it's a nonprofit international society dedicated to research, education, and patient advocacy in rare cancers. We organize symposiums, meetings on this topic, including penile, testicular, adrenal tumors. And so this is the Twitter website, our website. Uh, again, we don't make any money and it's all for cause uh, to try to educate people around the world and advanced science and research. Uh, so if anyone's interested, please check that out and happy to uh, give you a little more information if you're interested. So this is uh, some of our speakers. We are gonna be organizing an international meeting on variants of kidney cancer and on upper tract cancer, probably in March of 2021. And some of the international thought leaders are gonna be participating. And so definitely happy to uh, have you involved and, and attend that meeting if that's of interest. I tell people always, I, I train in Canada, so I always like to quote Canadian surgeon, Sir William Osler, some of you may know, is a, a physician who trained partly in the uh, United Kingdom and in Canada at my university where I did my undergrad in McGill. And he always says, the good physician treats the disease, the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. So personalizing our treatments to our patients is really critical. And I think that's when we get the best outcomes and also truly make sure we meet the needs and demands of our patients. This is my contact information, including my email. Again, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, at any point. And on that note, I thank you very much for your attention. Definitely hope this was uh, of value. And uh, again, I appreciate the invitation to speak to you tonight.
Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Spies? First of all, I would like to thank him for this brilliant presentation he did about uh, penal cancer treatment. Um, I have only one question about when you have genital warts, when you have condyloma, and you you use the bovi to remove the warts, do you think doing this can reduce the risk of developing cancer, penal cancer? Very good question. So you're right. So most of these genital warts are HPV associated. So they are preneoplastic lesions by definition. So I would say most likely, yes, uh, you are decreasing the propensity that these, some of these lesions can turn into penile cancer in the future. Uh, as you know, uh, as well as myself, as, as a surgeon, it's important to protect yourself. So whenever you remove these lesions, you know, I think we've now moved in North America to using these bovies with automatic suction. I know that's not available around the world. So whatever you do, make sure you protect yourself and your teams because the HPV, no question, is a risk factor for all of us that treat this disease. So, but I, I definitely think that those are those are reasonable and, th and things to consider in terms of the chance that these can turn in terms of carcinogenesis in the future. Okay, thank you. I don't know if anyone else has a question for Dr. Spies. Um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Can I go? Okay, yes. hi. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm not really sure it's a question. It was more like, can you um, go back to the HPV vaccination? Because I'm not sure I really understood. Because from what I understood, it's like the HP, HPV vaccination would be um, it has, it's more efficient in the other location, like, um, throat and everything, but for the penile cancer, it seems to not really have evidence that it works or something. I just wanted you to go back to, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm, sure I got it right. What you said is actually hundred percent correct. So oh, when, you okay. look, when you, when you look at the data on HPV vaccination, it definitely has very clearly shown a decrease in the incidence of head and neck cancer, uh, cervical cancer, no question. But when you look at the data on peanut cancer, there's really only one major study that was done. It's called the HIMSS study. It was done about, about 15 years ago by Anna Giuliano, who's a scientist at my institution. So they treated over 4,000 young men that got vaccinated. And then they looked at the incidence of external genital lesions. And they basically found that the incidence of external genital lesions was significantly less in the vaccinated group and the ones that got the quadrivalent vaccination. They were never able to show a decrease in the incidence of penile carcinogenesis. Now, whether or not these external genital lesions are precursors to penile carcinogenesis or not is where the debate sort of lies. The study never showed that, but I will tell you, because of the additional benefits associated with vaccination, it probably makes sense. And I do think, uh, no question, the problem with penile cancer is because it's such a rare cancer, it's very hard to show any type of vaccination prevention uh, type studies that a true decrease in the incidence. Okay. All right. Thank you. Anyone, You're welcome. anyone else? Dr. Oh. Yeah, I'm okay. You're okay. I'm okay. Okay. Dr. Spears, I have another question. Yeah, because most of the time, my patients in Haiti, when it comes to remove a part of their penis, they are pretty reluctant to do that. Uh, how is it for you, for your patient in the States? It's the same. It really is. It, it's a very challenging scenario. Um, I get it. You know, I've seen 25 year olds like you with penile cancer, and I, it just it breaks my heart to see the implications socio social, emotional, and the effect it has on them and their families. Uh, so it is challenging. I'm seeing a patient of my colleague tomorrow because he needs a total penectomy and he just doesn't want to have it done. So uh, yes, and I would tell you that I would love to tell you that I think certain socioeconomic classes are, are avoided of those concerns, but I literally saw a pilot for one of the major airlines in the United States with a fungating 
eight simmer penile tumor, which was bleeding and eroding through the skin. And I just looked at it and said, how did you leave thing? And they all, sometimes are, are so in denial, even when they become so advanced and they have such foul smells. So I, no one is really, um, I think, immune to the effects of this disease. What I've done in my institution is something that I've really encouraged, and there's a good website on this, and I can give you some more information, is I have patients who have penile cancer talk within a support group. Uh, there is a website called Check Your Tackle that was started by a patient in the United Kingdom for some really people who've dealt with this cancer and for, to talk to others that have dealt with it. And there's a good group that we work with, with, with the society I've started called ORCID. They're very strong in patient advocacy for penile cancer and all the cancers. And they, they definitely are allow patients to talk to other patients. You know, as you know, sometimes when I talk to patients, they say, you're a doctor, you don't understand. I need to talk to someone who's dealing with the same things I'm dealing with. Okay. Okay. But yeah. So the, I have a, a little question. Okay. Uh, what about the psychological uh, support and the management uh, after penectomy? Good question. For example, in your experience. There's a high instance of depression. I will tell you that I have all of my patients see our social worker and we screen them for depression and also truthfully for suicidal ideation too. Um, it's underreported. A couple of years ago, just to give you an example, I wrote a textbook on penile cancer and I asked people around the world to write a chapter on the psychosocial effect. We couldn't find a single expert that could write that chapter because no one really is doing research in that area. So it's poorly studied. I will tell you that we probably don't uh, do ask patients enough about this, but the incidence of depression and potential suicidal uh, thoughts and considerations is very, very high. And I would, I screen all my patients now and I offer them a support group. And, you know, a couple of times when I talk to patients, they start talking about se severe depression and I sort of get them involved and make sure we give them the support they need. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, we're going to go. Okay. Do you guys have any kind of device or reconstruction stuff that you're working on it, like to kind of reconstruct the penis after the penectomy? You don't have any um, upgrade or technology advancement in this field? Good question, too. Uh, so, yes, you know, we've done some of these forearm flaps, you know, with plastics and some of my reconstructive colleagues. I will tell you, most of the time, I wait a few years if we're going to do major reconstruction like this. It works fairly well, but it doesn't give the ideal result. There are some things happening now in the labs in terms of, you know, bioengineering and developing, especially now with 3D uh, modeling and printers to develop some type of of new, uh, I guess, biosynthetic type materials. It's not quite ready to be used clinically as of yet. So if someone's highly motivated, if they're young, then I'll wait a few years, then we'll do a major reconstruction with a forearm flap though. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, Ananda. Uh, do you use after penectomia? Do you use to, to manage the, the hormonal weight? like uh, testosterone rate to, to control the testosterone rate. In terms uh, of, in terms of erection uh, inhibition and stuff? To, to, prevent the, to prevent the patient as sexual desire, for example. It's a good question too. I, I would tell you, we don't typically, usually if it becomes a bother to them in terms of they feel that they, you know, the libido and the sexual desire and the fact they're not able to, to sort of have those relations is impactful to them, then yes, we would consider and we work with our endocrinologists in doing that. That hasn't been much of a concern as of now. And uh, I will tell you that we do uh, check in with them in terms of how they're doing in terms of sexual activity. You know, and we published on this too, is that most of the time, if you do penile sparing surgery or if you do a partial penectomy, most of the time these patients can maintain uh, sexual function to some extent. And sometimes it's actually pretty comparable to what it was before. Hmm. Yeah, and I think um, it's, 
a cultural aspect because in the States, they have more and more um, other things that they can use, even if they have the sexual desire, they got the sex toy and everything else, they can still have some um, fun without having the penis. So, yeah. so in Haiti, it's a little bit different because we don't have all of those things, but it's coming more common right now. Mm -hmm. But I think this part is supposed to like, you know, to understand what I mean. Mm -hmm. Oui. Mm -hmm. oui, je, je, je pose une question, tu, tu traduis, tu essaies de traduire. Ok. Je, je parle français that... aussi. Oh, you speak, how you speak French? It's I from Canada. Canada so. Je parle français. Ah, vous parlez français aussi? Oui, oui. Avec, avec plaisir, vous pouvez demander en français. Ah oui, Et, en Haïti, nous, il y a une, une opération qu'on avait l'habitude de... De, de, de faire, je ne sais pas si, comment ça se dit en français, c'est émasculation. Et dans cette intervention où, dans, où on, on a une pénectomie totale, radicale, avec ablation euh, de la verge, y compris les testicules. C'est émasculation, je ne sais pas comment ça s'appelle en anglais. Oui, on, on fait ce type d'opération. So we do this types of surgeries as well. So emasculation or, or total penectomy and, and complete removal of bilateral testicles on block. So we've done it a few times, unfortunately, if you have a very extensive tumor, which is involving the cords or the testicles, or truthfully, if it's all infected and you need to do that. Uh, we try to avoid that and try to maintain the testicles if at all possible. Sometimes we've done it, maintaining the testicles in thigh flaps, a little bit like what we do for Fournier's gangrene and other types of surgeries. Uh, or we do skin flaps, but no question, when you do the complete emasculation surgery, that I think has a major implication for the patients in terms of libido, andropause, a lot of downstream, I think, effects that could be really pretty detrimental for patients. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, if that's everyone, um, thank you, Dr. Spies, for speaking. And thank you, Dr. Yori, with co for coordinating. My pleasure. Ça fait grand plaisir de vous parler ce soir. Thank you very much for your attention. Very okay. best wishes to all of you. And uh, thank you. All thank you so very much. much. Thank you for your time. And we really appreciate that, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Have a thank good night. You.